Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Data Analytics, Decision Intelligence, or both. BAs hold the key to smarter, faster decision making. I'm your host, Tiffany Acolino, and I work on the marketing team at IIBA. IIBA is an independent, not-for-profit professional association serving the global business analysis community. A recognized thought leader dedicated to elevating the discipline of business analysis, we provide the global community with relevant tools, resources, and networking opportunities. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the questions tab in your control panel. We will answer some of your questions throughout the session as time permits. You can find today's deck in the handouts tab. Today's webinar recording will be available for a limited time on our IIBA webinar archives page within seven business days of the broadcast. As you know, I am here with your speakers today, Lori Silverman and Adrian Reed. Lori Silverman is a CEO of Partners for Progress. Known as the Shift Strategist, she helps enterprises across 25 industries navigate messy, complex changes and strategize about their future. She is a business storytelling pioneer with three best-selling books in the field and is known worldwide for her work in collaborative data-informed decision-making, a part of what she calls Data Literacy 2.0. Adrian Reed is a principal consultant at Blackmetric, where he provides the analysis, um, where he provides analysis consultancy and training to a range of clients. He is an author, international speaker, and a well-known blogger on all things business analysis related. He is also a former chapter of the IIBA UK chapter. Today, our speakers will discuss business data analytics, decision intelligence, collaborative decision making, and the culture needed to support this work. Lori has spent a lot of time fielding questions from the community in advance of today's webinar. So without further ado, I'll hand off the discussion to Lori and Adrian. Fantastic. Thank you so much for such a, a warm introduction. And um, so Laurie and I are, are, are going to have a conversation, really. And um, so please do, if you're tuned in live, please do uh, type questions in. I'm not sure how many we'll be able to cover live because Laurie's done a fantastic job of actually seeking so much data in advance to shape this conversation. Uh, but anything you put in there, um, if you know, if Laurie, I, I think you, you're happy to to cover things offline if you can't cover them during the session. So do feel free to to put your questions in the chat or the, the Q and A, and, and Laurie's very kindly agreed to to cover them. So um, Laurie, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think as BAs, really context is everything, and you know, data analysis, decision intelligence, all of these words. I mean, can you help us understand the, the context you're bringing to this webinar? Yeah, so I actually have a question about something, um, Adrian, I don't know about you. Have, do you know the game of hockey? No. You, ever been, no, you have never no, been to a hockey no, match, but I bet no, my Canadian no, colleagues here have. I grew up in the state of Wisconsin in the U.S., and when I went to college, the UW-Badger hockey team was like one of the best in the country. But um, I want to set up this webinar by... Um, talking about an adage from uh, Wayne Gretzky, who is a, a world-renowned hockey player in uh, Canada. And one of the things he's known for saying is he says, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it's been. Um, and as you and I talked about when we did a webinar recently on strategic thinking, there is, you know, the, the now, the next step, and the step after next. What I'm going to talk about today is what I consider to be not just the next step, but more the step after next um, mm -hmm. sorts of things that are going on because the, we're living in a very fluid time. And I think that COVID, um, you know, from my perspective, COVID completely accelerated change. So things that, you know, people thought might happen five years from now, like I have a client in the government industry who said to me, the, uh, we will never, ever go remote. Our executive director said we will never go remote. And all of a sudden, you know, they're living in San Francisco. They had to go remote. I mean, you know, so things, this collapsed, this window collapsed on top of mm -hmm. us. Um, the other piece of that, that collapsing that applies to what we're talking about today is um, very profound in the data industry. And that is um, all historical data became irrelevant and most of it became useless. 
this is huge because so many people depended on forecasting. And so what it's really making us think about is the issue on how do we get real-time data? And what's the implication for that? Um, I was speaking at a conference a couple of years ago in London, and I said to the folks who were talking about promoting data marketplaces and collecting like all the data an organization ever could ever have and cleaning it and shaping it and storing it. I said, why? Why are you doing that? And they laughed at me. They're not laughing today. Yeah. And, and this, right, this has been absolutely a profound. So what I want to really talk about is, is in this kind of like step after next is what are the what are the gaps that that I've been seeing because I've been standing out there in front for a long time now and then what are the opportunities that I think it poses to BAs um, as we go forward it's really interesting Laurie because one thing we were talking about before we started the webinar is about the accelerated pace of change and about how actually you know we're in a like it's like we're in a global pandemic all bets are off Yes. anyone can have an idea you know i mean before this meeting i was saying you know today i've had conversations with people who like i never thought would would, would want to listen to me right? right about ideas that just six months ago would have seemed crazy and i would have just got you know laughed out of the room so we're we're in a really interesting point where actually you know of course there's a we need to be mindful that, that, that there's all sorts of tragedy around it but but aside from that there's opportunities to innovate actually some of the structural barriers are out of the way. So this is really interesting. Yeah, it, it is. Um, so I have a, a kind of a, um, I wanna go backwards in history before we go forward, if that's okay. So I, I guess I have yeah. a different question for you. Um, you ever study astronomy? Only general knowledge. <laughs> general knowledge? Do you know any? Okay, so this, is a, this might be a trick question to you. Do you know anything about Copernicus? So he put the sun rather than the uh, he put the sun rather than the earth in the center of the universe, and he was he was ridiculed for it, from what I remember. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, well, actually, he wasn't the first person. There was actually a person before him, and not only was he ridiculed, but he was shamed, and um, his views did not take hold for a hundred years. I'm I'm sharing that with those of you here because I want. I want to bring another piece into this context um, because there is a huge mental model shift that I think we need to make. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and if it's okay, I want to spend a few minutes, if you're okay with this, kind of just outlining it. Yeah, please. What I want you to, to think about is, you know, prior to Copernicus, everybody thought that the universe um, centered around the Earth. And then there were people, he came out with others and said, no, it's around the sun. The very same thing is happening today. The very same thing in, in the data industry. The data industry, because of tech hype, is data centric. I'm not data centric. I'm decision centric. And I'm not just talking about a methodology for decision making. I'm talking about imagine an organization where every meeting, every job description, every, before you ever designed a dashboard, you'd be talking about what are the decisions we're trying to make? How are we going to use this data? This, this we are right now, I, I was thinking about it, like where are we? We're, we're starting to make the shift over to decisioning and maybe, and to me, this is what COVID's really helped with. I've been able to identify more people around the world who actually share this viewpoint, but there's not very many of us. And mm -hmm. so, like Copernicus, I'm probably going to be more, um, I could be a bit more controversial today in what I say, but let me kind of just flesh these out a little bit. This world on data centric talks about the fourth industrial revolution. This world on decision making talks about what BAs talk about. What about the consumer? What about the customer journey, which is absolutely critical. This world doesn't care about it this world does and that's it's a huge issue for those of you who are BAs because this world is fighting against you as much as you think it's embracing you it's not what that means in terms of enterprise architecture is that we now have stovepipes that have been created in organizations we don't really care about the, the processes I care about the processes you should care about the processes and the flow of processes across an organization for decisioning to work but the stovepipe application of software has popped up and those stovepipes don't talk to each other. 
And my friend Robert Bain talks about, and he's in the UK, he talks about you almost have to like punch holes in the stovepipes and weave spaghetti. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? And you've probably experienced that in your work. This is saying the common language is data. Over here, we're saying, no, the common language is teaching everyone a process for decisioning, which means that data decision democratization is important here. Data democratization is important here. Now, I'm not saying that this goes away. I'm just saying which master serves. And what we have to be thinking about is data serves decisioning, not vice versa. And that's, I, that's, that's a big shift to make. So if I can... Um, just elaborate for a second, like with an example. Mm -hmm. You know, in the in the data world, we often talk about the scientific method or hypothesis testing. Over here, we don't talk about that as much. What we talk about over here is what decision are you trying to make? So if someone comes to me asking for data, I don't I don't start to like think about, well, am I using predictive or descriptive or what sorts of tools might I might use? I'm really sitting down with them and having a conversation around what are you trying to do? And how are you going to use this data? And if they say to me, well, it's just going to sit on the shelf. I'm actually not going to use it. I don't do anything with it. Whereas someone over here is going to run out and try to do a whole bunch of work with it. And, and I just wanted to set this up up front because it's mindset. And if we don't make that shift in mindset, almost everything that I talk about today may not make as much sense uh, and, mm -hmm. and going forward. Um, but for, for me, this, this world is not a new world. It, it's interesting, and, and so much of what you were saying there resonates with me, Laurie, as a BA, because you sort of think about, well, actually, if it becomes about decisions rather than just the data, then there are all sorts of questions that need to be asked to understand how that decision is made and the, you know, and the data that's required to make that decision. And I'm sure there will be many people who are dialed in or watching the recording who have had that traditional situation where someone says, I just need a report. Yes. And they and and they and 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 we, we produce a report and they say and I want another report and another report um, and more data and can you cut the data for me in a different way because they're looking at stuff that's interesting but 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 it's interesting because as BAs if we can understand what that what decision they want to make then we can actually be part of that conversation as well so. I know, but before we move on to, to talk about decision intelligence in more depth, I know there are a number of questions about the data centric side of, of, of what you've decided, you just described that were, were sort of submitted in advance. So one of the, these questions is that people often confuse business analysis with business analytics and data analytics. What are the differences and overlaps? And the second question was, what is the difference between a BA in the analytics domain and those in the IT and software domain? What, what would your view on that be, Laurie? Um, I'm just going to touch on these really briefly. I mean, there's lots of literature that's out there. Let me take the second question first. If you're a BA in the IT and software domain, what you're looking at are analytics within the use of the software itself. If you're a BA, you could be in another domain. You could be in marketing. You could be in HR. You could be in sales. You could be housed anywhere within the organization. Now, you could also be housed within a separate analytics function. Um, there is a risk with that I, from my perspective. And the risk is like, I remember interviewing someone um, uh, a year ago for a, um, a talk that I was giving. And the woman said to me, we have 72 uh, folks doing analytical work sitting in a central organization. I said, what's their knowledge of the business? She said, help me to understand what you're asking. And this is where I think BAs can play such a huge role. You know the business of the business. A lot of these folks in analytical functions, data scientists don't. And that's, mm -hmm. and that's why you're absolutely necessary. Um, the, the second thing is that, um, and I did this this weekend, um, because I, uh, a colleague and I are, are uh, pitching to a university a, um, what we would call a business analytics certificate program. And so I went out to all the major universities that I could find, like in Oxford or Harvard or MIT and others. And I was just looking to see like, what's a court, Courts of courses are they offering under business analytics? None of them agree. None of them agree. There is not, um, and I'll come back to this in a second because I tested this um, a few days ago. But but there is there's no consensus around these are the sorts of skills or competencies that you should have if you gain a business or a data analytics background. And by the way, data analytics is akin to just data analysis. 
So when people use those terms, there's, they're, it's kind of like when you say business analyst versus doing business analysis work, you know how people sometimes play with those. The same yeah. thing is true in data analytics. Data analysis is considered to be things like extracting, cleaning, and preparing data, and then maybe using some math and some statistics to manipulate it or do calculations. You know, that that's all it is. Now, what the IIBA has done, this is my observation, is the, the IIBA, and you can see this, I just got this this morning. It's the latest iteration of the booklet book on the guide to business data analytics. And they there's a chart on page 11 that says, here's the work of business analysis, and here's the work of data analytics. And then there's a piece that's in the center. So the IIBA together calls this business data analytics. You won't find a course on this. This is the IIBA's term only. But in the center, the thing that joins them together has to do with how do we turn data and information into informed decision making. So this is a piece of what I'm talking about in terms of this overall mindset shift. So mm. the IIBA is moving in a direction that others aren't actually moving in. Because if you look at those business analytics programs I just mentioned to you, not a one of them, not a one of them includes a course on a step-by-step -step approach to doing collaborative data-informed decision-making. They just don't cover it, which I, I think is a huge gap if you're, you know, from my perspective. Yeah, and, and it's really interesting, Laurie, because as you were talking there, I was thinking, and I mean, I'd be interested to test this analogy to see if it, it works with you, but I was thinking about, I don't know, like if you imagine all the data points that are on a patient in a hospital, Right. So you've got that. You've got their temperature. You've got, um, I don't know, their pulse. You've got their blood oxygen reading. You've got the uh, and, and all of these uh, and things that, that take time to come. So you might have their blood readings, but that's got to be sent to pathology in the lab. Um, uh, but all of those things like actually and actually out of context, they mean nothing. Like, right. you know, if I, if I say 37, that means nothing. If I say 37 degrees centigrade or whatever the equivalent is in Fahrenheit, that means something. But actually, it needs somebody to take all of those data points and understand the context and facilitate a decision being made about that patient. So is that is that a similar to what we're talking about here? Well, um, so, so I want to I want to come at this a little bit different way, um, yeah. if that's OK. I'm going to I'm going to mm -hmm. kind of spin it a bit um, and, and I'm going to uh, make a confession to those people who are listening to us today. Um, this very sort of thinking sparked a question for me on Tuesday evening. And um, and, and, and it sparked it because it, it um, is akin to some very technical um, questions that came to me, which I won't be able to answer in this webinar, but I promise those of you who asked them, I'll come back and I'll answer them through LinkedIn. Um, but I, I went out on my LinkedIn page and I asked a very simple question. I said, I'm curious, how do you define the difference between a data scientist, which is kind of what you're talking about, okay, someone mm -hmm. who just wants to explore the data, and someone who does data analytics? And, and the reason I'm confessing this to you is because I said, oh, I thought, oh, this will be really simple. I'll use the results here with all of you, and I'll talk about them. Now, Adrian knows what happened because I like... I'm, I'm, I'm like the middle of the night, I think I'm like texting you. I'm like, Adrian, this is blowing up um, right now. And we're not even to the end of Thursday, so this is we're just like 30 some hours into this, there are 26,000 people who have viewed this post. There are hundreds of comments on it. And the, the question that Adrian's asking is actually a very messy question. And um, so I'm gonna ask you to do something when you're done. If you, if you want a link to this particular post, all you have to do, I put it on the homepage of my LinkedIn profile. You can just click on it under the features and you can immediately go to it. Don't read the comments in like the most recent to the earliest. Start at the earliest because I comment as much as I can to everybody and look at the most recent. Um, but the second thing is I want you to think about the following. If every person you read was your boss, what would their expectation be of you as a business analyst doing analytics work? And I and, and what you're going to find when I'm going to kind of like, you know, burst the balloon here is that there is no agreement. There's mm -hmm. no agreement on anything. There is no agreement on what a data scientist should do. There's no agreement on what a data analyst should do. There's no agreement on 
um, the difference between analytics and science. Uh, there's no agreement on, um, I started to ask some people because I started to get curious when they started to talk about like, here's the interdependency between the roles, no one mentioned a BA. So I started to say, well, hey, what would the role of a BA be? And I actually had people say to me, and I want you to think about this folks, because this is really critical. You've got to go into the, the world of these people. You can't sit in your world. You've got to go get meet them where they are. They said, well, a BA doesn't have the skills to define the problem up front. <laughs> Which takes me all the way back to what you've just said about this data on healthcare. They would say to you, oh, you, you can't, you don't know what to do with that. And you'd be going, but I have really great elicitation skills. I have really great um, skills about diving deep into what an organization says. And what do you mean I, I can't like pose the problem? They're like, no, it's a, actually a data scientist knows more than you. They have to pose the problem to you. So then maybe then if you have uh, some analytical background, you could do the analysis work for us. But then we're going to have to pull it from you after that because you probably don't know how to do the data visualization piece either. Wow. Wow. I know. I know. It, I, I tell you, I was, I, I'm still answering questions. People, I, I got to tell you, you have to go look. Don't do it now because you'll miss out on the rest of this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> I got to promise me that. But I did this because I thought, oh, this would be real-time input to bring. And what it's taught me is that real-time, it's I'm going to take your disruption piece where everything is up for grabs. I yeah. kind of see it as a person who um, is crossing a river, taking a hike maybe in the wilderness, and they put their left foot on one rock and their right foot on another rock. But what they didn't realize is that the rocks would move when yep. they did that. And their split, their feet are like splitting, and they're going to do like the splits and like, hey, wait a minute, you hear? You know, like <laughs> think they're moving and the current's moving. This community that you're entering doesn't understand what's going on. Um, yeah. Does that make does that make any sense to you? I mean, in terms of what yeah, I'm sharing? yeah, yeah. No, it definitely did, Laurie. And, and I was thinking as you were saying that that whole pattern about having you know, people not necessarily understand that BAs can do problem analysis, you know, that, that actually we're, we're actually very valuable before the solution is known. That That's a common pattern that we're, I think, used to trying to break down as BAs, because of course the reality is, I mean, if you look at IIBA's business analysis body of knowledge, strategy analysis, which starts long before a project and continues throughout is really important. Understanding the external environment, the internal environment, the, you know, all of those sorts of things. So uh, here's a question for you, Laurie. I'm pretty sure I know what your answer to this will be, but I want to ask it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so to understand the this world better, because you mentioned about the technology, and, and in fact, there are a number of questions in the Q&A that, uh, that sort of reflect this as well. It's like, should we go out, go out straight away and learn like AI, M you know, machine language, Tableau, Power BI, or is that tech hype? that for us is that, you know, they may be useful tools, but for us as analysts, are we better sticking to our core competencies? What's your view on that? Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back in time. Um, I, when I was 30 years old, um, and I already had two master's degrees, that's when I learned statistics. And the fundamentals of statistics have served me well this day. I mean, I can carry on conversations with data scientists. I don't want to do statistical work today, but I can actually understand what they're talking about. I don't know R. I don't know Python. I don't know, you know, frameworks like Hadoop. I don't know, you know, uh, the, the types of visualization tools as well as they might in terms of Tableau or Power BI. But we can carry on a conversation. And to me, that is the most critical piece. What you, it's, it's, um, so years ago, so this would be like when I was 30 years old, you're talking now um, late 80s, because I'll be um, 62 next month. At that time, we were telling people everybody needed to learn statistics, that that was the necessary prerequisite to doing business. And somehow that got lost. It mm -hmm. just changed. I don't know what happened. Well, it changed in 2000 when the tech companies just went, hey, look at all our startups and you all come work for us and let's play games and look at all the wonderful applications we have. We're cycling back. This is not new. However, in my in my, from my vantage point, if you don't know the basics or fundamentals of data of analytics or analysis and the fundamentals of statistics, you don't have the necessary prerequisites to be in almost any job today. 
those those to me are going that's that's what this is bringing back almost full circle um so the challenge becomes if that's the requirement what's the differentiator because yeah, if you were yeah. thinking if you were thinking oh i'm gonna go and get a data science degree because a lot of people wrote this to me you know what tool should i use should i go do data science i'd say go get a degree in decision science i mean of all the different degrees that i look at right now that's the one it, it's still not complete but that's the one that at least is going to focus a bit on decisioning it's going to give you the analytic uh, piece and it's going to give you the the um the business um psychology piece of this as well which is critical but but i'll come back and i'll expand on that a little bit later a little bit more later mm -hmm. um but there's another piece i want to add to this too because of this mess that's out there um i'm not the first person to see it um there has been an association that was formed i think in 2018 um called the i have it here for myself because i couldn't remember the name it's kind of long it's the initiative for analytics and data science standards and they're trying to figure out what data scientists should do. Now, mm -hmm. what you may not know is that the term data scientist was coined in 2008. It's only a term that's 12 years old. It was coined by a guy from Facebook and a guy from LinkedIn. Tom Davenport talks about it in an HBR article called the sexiest job on the planet is being a data scientist. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to think about that. Facebook, LinkedIn, tech companies. I mean, this is, I think, what people are missing. You know, so if you're going to go get your training, I mean, and, and, and I'm tech agnostic, so it's not like I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult here with anyone or put anyone down, but get your training through an institution that's not related to a tech organization. Yeah. So that you're, right. So that you're not learning a biased approach because that's that might hurt you long, uh, along the line. Um, and so I, I feel very grateful that I learned this stuff a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. So interesting. So you talked about you, you talked a little bit about the differentiator, and and, and you talked about um, you know statistics and so on. And I, I agree, it's interesting. I think it, it's useful to know statistics, even just so that you can have that critical ability to you, you know when you get like a data visualization or or, or even just a a chart or a graph that's really misleading because yeah. someone's used the wrong type or or, or they haven't used the best type of visualization and it, and it can actually mean that people take the wrong exactly the wrong path with confidence because it's leading them down the wrong path so yes. i think having that ability to to question as we do as bas so thinking about the the differentiator today so is it is it sort of decision intelligence and if so can you elaborate a little bit i know you've touched on this already but elaborate a little bit about what what that means well, but first I gotta come back. I gotta come back to your comment about that data visualization because I have a real pet peeve. I have a, no, seriously, I have a real pet peeve about this. I see this all the time. And this is how I know someone doesn't know an analysis and statistics. They'll take time ordered data and they'll put it in a bar chart. Yes, 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 yes. And yes, I'm yes. like, oh my gosh, not only do they not understand, what they don't understand is variation and how to actually look at data over time and see if things are shifting. And then what'll happen is on the bar chart, they'll see one spike and they'll go, oh, we need to do something about it. And I'm like, no, no, we do not need to do anything about it. Not until you've calculated, data scientists call it, you know, confidence levels. I talk about it as, you know, calculating your standard deviation, you know, cause you have to understand, is that special? Is that common? Cause it might just be mm -hmm. that there's a lot of variability, but I just, I had to, that's like my biggest pet peeve. So, um, yep. I'm glad that you raised that for people. And, it, and by the way, this is not trivial. I see this happening all the time because people are te teaching data visualization courses with disregard for statistics. And that's huge too. You need to see the integration of them together. But um, and, and, and just, to, just to interject yeah. and, and, and amplify that point, Laurie, I don't know if you've seen this, but I've seen situations where if that visualization is not at its best and even worse, if the data is stale, then what you get is you get a vast overreaction to something that didn't need reaction to, and you get like the kind of bullwhip effects, like they're forever going up, up and down. You're, you're, you're kind of putting your hand in the shower and saying it's too hot, well, or let's put it, but now it's too cold because the feedback is so is so is so so delayed. So uh, anyway, I interrupted you, Laurie. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> actually, um, uh, years ago, and I worked for Dr. Deming. We called that Rule Four of the Funnel Experiment. <laughs> so there's actually a game you can play where you can demonstrate that happening. Um, so let me go back to um, 
decision intelligence. This is a term that was coined by uh, Laurie and Pratt um, about eight years ago. Um, Cassie Kaskroff at Google immediately picked up on it. Um, it's, it's an evolving field, at least that's what, the way the two of them look about it. And, and Lorian and I have had many conversations and she's been a guest on my LinkedIn live show a few weeks ago. Um, the way that, that Cassie talks about it, and so this is just kind of like a nomenclature piece, is she says it's the combination of practical data science, the social sciences, management science, and then what I've said to Lorian and her are, and psychological sciences. So it's all of these different fields of practice coming together. Now, for me, in terms of decision intelligence, when I'm working with CEOs, I, there are two questions that really stand out to me. One is, um, outside of an innovation lab, what's the cost of making a wrong decision? And number two, if we make the right decision, what's the cost of not fully actioning it? Because they both have costs. Now, for those of you who are wondering, you know, is this just like a couple women out there like having these ideas and, you know, now they're bringing them forward. Um, I just want to refer you to a Gartner report that uh, was written in 2018 that said that this is the next big thing in the data arena. Um, they don't, I, I don't have access to the report because I'm not, a, um, I'm, I, I don't um, subscribe uh, financially to Gartner. I mean, in terms of getting the reports, but um, this is key in terms of, of what's coming out so the the problem we have is that to me decision intelligence which is a part of this bigger mindset shift right that i'm talking about mm -hmm. so people think that they're that they're doing things under the guise of decision intelligence when they say oh we'll use the data science um OCM approach um mm -hmm. and OCM standing for you know obtaining data scrubbing data things like that and, or, or maybe we'll just talk about the life cycle of data and the life cycle of data being, you know, I'll collect it, I'll clean it, I'll mine it, I'll reduce it, you know, things like that. Or some people even talk about it, and I'm going to go, and this is going to be a little bit touchy, as the scientific method, you know, where it is hypothesis testing. And all I'm going to say about hypothesis testing is you're biasing yourself right from the start mm -hmm. because you're testing a potential solution. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what these other women are talking about. What we're talking about, and actually this, if you get Lorian, uh, Lorian's book called Link, she talks about this front end piece. I take it all the way through in terms of a step-by-step -step method for looking at decisions. But she really says, let's put down on paper the mental model that people mm -hmm. are using. It's, it's kind of like what you talk about in, in um, systems thinking, you know, balancing and reinforcing loops. Let's understand their mental framework around just the decision itself, especially if it's something that's being done over and over and over again, or is a chronic big problem that's going on in organizations. Um, and 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 I agree with that. That we need we need to spend more time on the front end. And it, and it sounds a little bit like the work you do, doesn't it? Just yeah. dawned on me, right? Yeah. That's that front yeah. end work that you that you really spend a lot of. Well, and and that's it. And it's, I mean, so much so much so many ideas being provoked by what you said there, Laurie. I mean, I think certainly. It is interesting when you talk about high, high, you know, the scientific method and hypothesis. That that does, as you say. I, I mean, you know, there are there are different approaches to inquiry, and you know, a hypothesis driven, a reductionist approach is just one. So that's an interesting, uh, an interesting observation. But also, as you were talking about the Osman type approach, I was thinking, hmm, that's really interesting. So if you've got obtain, scrub, and I think it's explore, model, right. something like right. this, right? Well, well, actually, okay, hmm. Uh, with my business analyst hat on, well, well, actually, how do you know what to obtain? Like, actually, there's some thinking that needs to happen before, right? And right. and I'm thinking as a BA, oh, well, that's that's elicitation, that's analysis, that's a little bit of strategy analysis. That's where I could probably help someone, for sure. And I'm also thinking, you mentioned about action, actioned decisions. And I worked, as I'm sure we all, or many of us have, worked in organizations where the problem wasn't actually... Um, necessarily having the decision made it was the commitment to action yes. so so actually if you if you haven't got that upfront piece that says well hang on a minute you know prop what are we trying to do here what context do we live in what mental models are we seeing the world through and if you if you then haven't got the bit at the end which says right we now know which direction we want to go in and let's do it then the bit in the middle is kind of useless 
<laughs> well, yeah, but there's but there's a there's a bigger issue with this whole thing. And I just heard this. I listened in on a couple of webinars yesterday. Everybody talks about this decisioning process as analytical. And it's not. It's okay. not. This is where decision intelligence deviates from all these other methods. So if I think about, let me just give you, just play with you very simply. If we talk about, and, and I'll add your pieces to this, you know, how do we take raw data and how do we move it to insight? And then how do we move from insight to a decision and then to action, okay? There is a front end piece that is all about strategic thinking, not mm -hmm. analytical thinking. Hypotheses mm -hmm. are analytical thinking. Strategic thinking is what you're starting to allude to. Why do you need this? How are you gonna use it? You know, um, and because what you find most times is that what people are asking for is not what they need. Mm -hmm. and, and so, what, so what you're not doing is you're not reducing the conversation, you're exploring and opening the conversation and making it bigger. Now, what'll kind of happen is you'll have a leader who'll say to you, I haven't thought about that, or I don't have time for it. But yet you do have to have time for it because here's what's going to happen. They don't have time for it. And you go through all these and, the, you know, from there into a few an, an analytical pieces and you say, oh, here's the insight I've got. They're going to say, uh, yeah, I need you to go back to the beginning because that doesn't fit well with me. So you're going to yeah. sit in this loop of doing analytical work if you don't do the strategic piece up front. The second place where the strategic thinking comes in is in insights and and. And I got to tell you, this one just blew me away. Um, on this post that I'm asking you all to kind of take a look at, and by the way, you should comment too, on it, um, there was a SVP who used the word insight. So I'm like, oh, I, I teach this in a graduate class, you know, like how do I approach this topic with him? So I just said, what do you mean by the word insight? And he gave me a couple examples. And one of the examples he gave me, Adrian, I'll give you two of them. He said, I want you to imagine it like an X, Y axis. And there's a line that goes up, a linear line. I'm like, hey, that, that, that's not an insight. That's, not insight. That's, a, that's an observation of the data. Yeah. You know? yeah I'm like, yeah. And, I, and I came back to him and I said, um, well, first of all, yeah, maybe there's a line, but how do I even know that those, there's a relationship between these two variables or there's a correlation between them or that this is meaningful. And, and then I don't know like the size of the axes that are used. Cause you know, like with COVID, what people like to do is they like to, they sometimes like to explode things or make them look minimalistic. And on the US, we make them look minimalistic. We don't want to make it look that bad. Um, just, just my aside. Um, and, and, and so we don't even know if we've got the axes calculated correctly. He, he doesn't get insight. And so I came back to him and I gave him a paper <laughs> on the difference between insight and intuition. And by the way, intuition is a form of data. This is the other thing that people's decisioning methods eliminate, and I don't. You must have intuition incorporated at this front end piece. You've got to understand mm -hmm. where people intuitively think things are going to go before you ever get into the analysis. But anyways, I gave him a paper. I gave him a video. And um, he came back to me and he said, oh, now you want to get technical on me. And I'm like, he's the leader of a technical group. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so not, not Laurie, with that in mind, how would you how would you define insight? How would you, in a nutshell, define it? Well, hang on to that for just a second, because I just want to make certain that I follow through on this. And that's a really good question. So, again, if you have this continuum, you've got strategic thinking at the front end that you've got to do as a BA. You've got strategic thinking at the point of insight because there are multiple kinds of insights that come out. Knowledge insights are not sufficient. You better be talking about insights that you can actually action today and tomorrow. And then on the back end that Adrian, that you mentioned this um, piece about implementation, that's strategic thinking too. That's not analysis yeah. because I've got to start thinking about organizational change and how is this going to stick with people. And, um, and another aside on this, that's, a, that um, is a, is a, is an awkward thing to talk about um, is that 99% of the books on data storytelling are not about storytelling. They're about data visualization. That's a bit problematic too. Um, so, and that's gonna come into your insights and then your actioning piece over here because people have said to me, well, why is it that I think I found an insight and they have, and I can't get people to do anything about it. And I'm showing them data visualizations because that doesn't move the human brain mm. to do anything, right? Well, but your question, I mean, you had a question about insight, like what is an insight? So. The academic word for it is aha. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> I'm serious. In the, in, in, it's, it's an aha. It's not a gut feel. A gut feel is an intuition. And, okay. and insight comes when people remove themselves from the data. They let their unconscious mind just kind of work, might sleep on it, might go take a run, might go do other things. And all of a sudden, an answer appears. Like the mm. connect the dots just happens in the brain. We have this happen all the time, right? So let me give you an example of this. Um, uh, and this is a, a US centric example, but um, one of the questions that has plagued schools for a long time here is high schools where kids drop out of high mm -hmm. schools. And so, you know, schools and, and parent teacher associations and others want to know the causes of why kids drop out of school. So what would you say some of those causes might be that, that, we'd, that we probably, in terms of our own mental models, would be looking for if we're looking through the data? So why kids drop out, I don't know. It could be, um, well, it could be that actually they are not academically minded so maybe they're you know maybe actually their aspirations are more to have a, a trade so you know and and the the curriculum of the school doesn't work for them it might be that they have other needs that are not met by the traditional school system it might be that they have a family situation that is difficult and means that they want to attend but can't and and a whole a whole heap of other reasons i'd imagine mm -hmm. Do you want to know what the number one reason was? But um, this wasn't the Parent Teacher Association that figured this out. No, what, what is it? The company called Whirlpool. What does Whirlpool make? What, Whirlpool? They make, like Whirlpool, fridge? yeah. They, they learned when they looked at the data, and then this was a surprise to them, as it was to everyone else, because they, they had a hunch. They're like, all of these things that you're talking about, people have tried to action through the years, and it's not changed the chronic problem that exists. Mm. Kids don't want to come to school because they have unclean clothes. Wow. Dirty clothes. So what they've been doing in school districts across the US, now this is pre-COVID, not post-COVID, right? You know, um, is putting uh, washers and dryers into the schools so kids and parents can wash clothes. Wow. Wow. I know. That but that that is someone really i mean your step you have to step aside because what you need to take is a very different frame to the whole situation because you're not going to go in saying well i'm gonna like look at you know do kids have dirty clothes that's not but that's never going to be in someone's frame right yeah yeah and, and and like like you say i can't ever imagine that being intuition so presumably presumably that was an insight that's an example of an insight laurie well but it's but it comes from talking to kids this is what BAs do really well it's the yeah. uh, it's the it's the qualitative research the qualitative yeah. like I have a hunch sort of thing let's go talk to the kids but let's not ask them to answer questions let's have them tell us stories mm. about what's going on but what they did with this that's absolutely brilliant and I include this in a class that I, I teach for a university on, on decision making like how do you go through a decisioning process is they um, created a video of children telling the story of what it's mm -hmm. like and how they hit the nail on the head. Now, what I do wonder about is that with virtual learning, if that's changed, right? Now that kids are at home and it might maybe yeah, it's different. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, um, it ra it raises, but um, it's tr it's insight comes fully formed. The analogies that I give are it's like a sculptor standing in front of a piece of marble and being able to see the form fully done. It's like someone, if you paint, standing in front of a canvas and being able to see it, a painting completely done. It's the yeah. ability to see, but that ability to see is a combination of all different kinds of data. It's a combination of intuition, to your point, yes. Yes. that gets to human reasoning. So one of the things data science is now talking about is we can't take the human out of this. And, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because like to, to bring some of the threads you've talked about already, Laurie, together, you, you talked about things like mental models, right? right. And, and you talked about psychology. And, and it's almost like, and, and, and this is going to sound like a very academic thing to say, and I kind of, I, but I can't think of a, another way of saying it, but it almost feels like, it, you know, has data science been driven down a sort of natural science route Whereas, whereas perhaps it should be more of a social science route, or, or for those of you know, for those who are very academically minded, has it been driven down a reductionist route, and it should be a sort of constructivist type route? Is that sort of what you're getting at, Laurie? 
Well, actually, if you read this post, what you and, and let's stay with this, but let me tell you the first piece that I've observed. Data analytics and data science are collapsing on each other. Okay. And data science is very angry that they're being reduced to data analytics. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's like the lowest common denominator. And so you have a lot of data science. If you look at, there's a report that came out in July. You know what the number one activity of a data scientist is? Data preparation. That's where they spend all their time. Wow. They're not even wow. doing the science of data science. And so in some organizations, some of the people uh, uh, put this down, they said, we're, we want our data scientists to really do science. We, we understand exploration and innovation. And so we've got them doing that. And, and, and we really have to be thinking about what are the other roles that are necessary then to doing the other work with, you know, like, what decisions need to be thought about before I ever put together a dashboard, yeah, you know, yeah. um, or someone coming with an un, a one-off request, you know, for 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 wanting, you know, I want this piece of data. No, you don't. Be my answer. No, the you BA. don't. It's the BA. The BA. <laughs> you want one that's but that's it. But nobody's talking about the BA. Yeah, yeah. And I actually thought about. I haven't. I haven't done this yet. But I was thinking about. Do I put up a post that says, "What's the role of the BA"? in data analytics and data oh, science and tag the exact same to. people. I, I don't know what will happen if they'll respond to it. They might, they you, may you, need to, you need to do that, Laura. I think that'd be great. So, so one thing I remember when, I think when I, when we were at the BA summit, South Africa, actually in, in Cape town, I remember because there are a few questions in the, in the Q and A about frameworks and, and you, you know, you've mentioned some frameworks, but I vaguely recall, and I apologies if I get this wrong, Laurie, it was a while ago, uh, but you were working on a framework that was smart or smarter or something like that. Is that something you're able to share with us? Well, actually, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to kind of give you the, the overview of it. Um, the name Smarter is something that you and I talked about in your webinar. So you're, oh, you're, is that where it came from? Yeah, okay, yeah, right, okay. Was, it was. Um, <laughs> yeah, what, what happened was, um, just to give a little bit of history here, so, um, I started writing about decisioning in 1988. So I've been all looking at decisioning frameworks and decisioning models for a lot of years. I just didn't ever realize I was doing that, <laughs> I guess you could say. Because <laughs> we would flow chart the decision-making process for senior leadership teams to say, if you're gonna make policy decisions, what are the steps you're gonna go through? Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, we started with you know, this framework of you know, data, insight, decision, story, action. And then, um, and, and I've been working with that and crowdsourcing it. Some people who are listening in may have heard me give workshops over the past five years. In February, I, um, I said to my colleague, who's my co-developer, I said, uh, we need an acronym. Uh, people have to be able to remember this. And, and I, um, I put a folder on my desktop and I called it Smarter. And I don't know why I did that. I just put it there. And then I went to bed and I woke up. This was my insight. I woke up like in the middle of the night and what it fits the framework it fits the framework so smarter starts with you know how do you set the context but again i'm not talking about hypothesis pieces here i'm talking about um the what are you going to use the data for what sort of decision are you trying to make why is this important who really cares about it who's going to use it all of those sorts of questions that bas are really good at asking and that again strategic thinking the M is for managing the data because you know raw data is coming in, but you have to understand something, and this is a huge tech issue as well. The technology you use has its own algorithms. It's mm -hmm. going to manipulate the data. The example I give of this is I had a couple guys in a class one time from a manufacturing facility, and they said that they um, got a new piece of software, uh, and the output of the manufacturing lines was to go into the software and then give them better reporting or whatever. And everything that they make is whole numbers, one, two, three, four. They pull out their first report, and the numbers are 1.234. <laughs> They're like, where did the decimal points come from? Where did they come from? And they like studied this for like a couple of weeks, like, where is it coming from? They go back to the software provider, and the software provider said, how many manufacturing lines do you have? And they said, four. They said, oh, that software only works on one line. Right. So the M, managing, the M in managing data is really key. The E is a piece that's often forgotten as well. That's a sure confidence. The question we think about there is, is the data valid and reliable considering the source? So this yeah. is where data quality comes in, but it's also source meaning person. 
because what we know, one of the biggest influences and whether data will be used at the end is who provided it. And if that person is not credible um, within the organization, uh, it doesn't matter because the leader will say, who worked on this? And that's the decision they're making in their brain. So you need to be able to think about what are all the steps to assuring confidence. The R is to revealing insights. And as I mentioned for us, we don't, we don't stop at knowledge insights. In fact, we don't find knowledge insights to be all that useful. And by the way, this question up front that you're posing better not be written as a knowledge question. It mm -hmm. needs to be specific and actionable. People will sometimes say, well, I want to know the top cause of fraud in our company. Uh, no, you don't. What you want to know is um, how do we eliminate the top cause of fraud in our company while also continuing to satisfy our customers? Yeah. Because Which, this way, uh, what's, you know, it's uh, a different sort of actionable question, right? And again, as you're, you know, as you're speaking there, Laurie, I'm thinking with my BA hat on. Wow, that's a problem statement. You know, these are things we define as BAs. So there's, you know, there's there are so many, so many natural connections here. Absolutely. But again, it's written in an actionable manner, and these can also be opportunities too. You don't have to say it's a problem. It could be that, yeah. you know, let, let's look at, you know, um, um, and I don't have a question top of mind right now for like a market that we want to go into, you know, like yeah. what might be the top market we want to enter, given all of the things we know are going to happen in 2030, as an example. Mm -hmm. So the R is for reveal insights. The E or the T, if I go smarter, T is for take a stand. Um, the decision has to be made. There has to be a place in the decisioning model, and people forget this, for the time that will be spent actually crafting the story, and I'm talking about human narrative story here, without data, without a visualization, where mm -hmm. some people might go, no, it can't be done. Yes, it can be done. Um, that will move people to action, to actually make a decision. And then you've got execute on the decision and relay results at the end. But that is not relay results of the data. It's relay results of the actual implementation of the decision. Now. What I encourage people to do with a framework like this is just take a decision that you've like already have made, one that um, and how much time did you spend in each of these places on the continuum? Yeah. And how yeah. many times did you circle around? Because what we're trying to do here, like the IBA talks about the six domains of decisioning, and those domains fit in here, but it's not the process for decisioning. We're trying to get you to be smarter by going linearly. We don't want you to be cycling back. We don't want you to be setting it down and coming back to it in three months. And so you need to start thinking about this piece. I, I had a CEO um, say to me recently, he kind of looked at me because we were working um, with, a, I was working with a group of CEOs. And I said, what are the top three decisions that you need to have your executive leadership team make in the next 30, 60 days? And we were talking about all of this and he said, you know what I've never done? I've never ever tracked the cycle time. <laughs> he said, and I have this gut feel that we don't make decisions for six to nine months, maybe even a year. We just repurpose them, we reconstitute them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, continually getting the, the same results. And I was just thinking when you were talking about the narratives there, because it's sort of interesting, you think about, I mean, it's very topical at the moment, of course, but the pandemic we're in, you know, you could you could share all sorts of statistics about the pandemic, but actually the, the, the message which is going to motivate people to act and behave differently is going to vary by the by the, the by the by the group of the group of people and just communicating out that, you know, like, well, the, you know, the infection rate is X and your statistical chance of catching COVID is Y. And if you catch COVID at this age, your, your chance of mortality is, is Z, is not very, uh, is not very, it, it, it doesn't speak so much, but saying something like, you know, okay, uh, you might be young, you might survive it, but you might kill an elderly relative by being a, you know, an asymmetric carrier can be a very, uh, certainly in the UK, that's been a very strong message. So that whole thing around narrative is is interesting. So um, I'm conscious that we've got just a, a few minutes, uh, a few minutes left really before we need to hand back to the, uh, the IIBA folks. So um, what's your key takeaway, Laurie, for the BA community? 
Uh, uh, well, I think there's a couple key takeaways. First of all, you need to learn the fundamentals of analytics and statistics. I mean, you need, and you need to, because you need to be able to speak the language of all these other people in your organization. The second yeah. thing is you have to get to know everybody in your organization that is doing this work. I don't, I don't know what job title they have. Now, if you're in a, a company of 200, that's easier than if you're in a company of 10,000, you want to, you know, work within your business group or your, your sphere of influence. But the reason you want to know them is I really think that the role of BAs is to manage this process, to facilitate this process. First of all, mm. I've yet to find, I have yet to find Adrian, an organization that has adopted a decision-making step-by-step approach. And that's my call to action for BAs is, you know, who's gonna be the first to really bring a methodology. I know people do individually, they come to my workshops and do it, but as an organization to adapt something like that, that everyone's using, because that's the common language, right? Mm. But you gotta make friends with people to start get moving them in the right direction of doing this. And then the, the, you know, the, the other piece I think with that is don't wait to be asked to do this. You can do this on your own. I, you, you just have, to, I mean, if the only thing you do, like I coach a woman right now and the only thing she's doing because we're doing this in baby steps in her organization is all she does when she enters a meeting is she says, what are the decisions that need to be made today in this meeting? That's all she's doing. It's a very simple, and she said, Lori, everything is shifting. She's the head of a PMO. Everything is shifting. Like the conversations are shifting and people will go, oh, we didn't, we have the topics. We didn't think about the decisions. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And it, it's just those very subtle things that can start to move you along the right path. But I think for me, I mean, if I, I'm an idealist because I know that this can work you can bring a method into an organization. If you've got 30 BAs who are working in, in your company, if every one of them knew it and if every one of them was using it with their stakeholders, imagine the difference you could make. This is the number one gap in my eyes that yeah. exists. But again, remember, I'm standing out here looking back at today, right? No, Everybody's no, no. kind of like in the world of today. Yeah, and it's really interesting, and I love what you say there about not asking for permission. You know, I mean, this echoes what we said at the very beginning. We're on in unprecedented times. Organizations will accept things that they perhaps didn't accept in in the past. And I think I'm reflecting from this, Laurie, that there's a lot for for us to learn as BAs, a lot for me to learn, and you know, I'm going to probably start thinking about development or training or something in this in in this this area. And in fact, let's let's run a, let's run a poll at the very end of the session, and um, that, that'll just just to keep our our IIBA facilitators on their on their toes um, to see to see what actions uh, people people are going to take. So, Laurie, we could um, we could talk for hours about this. I, I mean. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to have this conversation. And I know you're going to respond to questions that we haven't been able to cover live. I've tried to weave a few in as we've gone along. So I will now hand back to the, the, uh, the kind folks at IIBA for the, the formal close of the webinar. Well, before we do that, Adrian, thank you. I really appreciate <laughs> you joining me today and facilitating this conversation. And kudos to you. Uh, hey, anytime, Laurie. My pleasure. <laughs> And while we're all saying thank you, thank you both for such a wonderful discussion. And yes, we are gonna open up and just wrap up with a quick uh, poll question right now. You can submit your responses using the voting tool in your control panel. And the poll will be open for about uh, 60 seconds. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, launch that poll right now. And based on today's discussion, what action do you plan to take now? And the poll is now open and I'm seeing some answers populating. This is going to be really interesting, Laurie. Yeah. I, I, I love the, 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 the final one, bury my head in the sand. I wonder how many people are going to take that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we've gotten a good amount of responses. I'm, I'm going to close it. And I'm going to share the results. Drum roll. Let's see. Okay. Awesome. It is. So we look. Is. Looks like the majority um, are going to be looking for information, books, articles, podcasts, videos um, on on um, this topic. So that's great. 
Two, two percent are going to bury their head in the sand, Laurie. Yes, I, I <laughs> that's, interesting. that's interesting. That's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> so I would like to do another. I know you've both uh, thanked each other, and and I thank you for a great discussion. But thank you for your time and your your expert insights. Uh, the best place to reach um, both Lori and Adrian is on LinkedIn, as you heard, very active on LinkedIn and through their respective websites, partnersforprogress.com and blackmetric.com. Also check out Lori's YouTube channel, Level Up with Lori, where you can find lots of free videos and content on today's topic. Uh, many of you are, are going to be looking for that based on our poll question. And you can also check out Adrian's blog at www.adrianreed.co.uk, where you'll find tons of articles available as well. Thank you to our attendees for being here today. We will send a follow-up email to you. Please feel free to respond with any questions or comments you may have. Thank you for joining us today, and we will see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.